Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Inspection of Thermal Spray Coatings. We're glad that you're joining us. My name is Josiah Lockley, and I'm with JPCL and Paint Square. It's my pleasure to be the moderator for today's webinar. This webinar is organized by SSPC, the Society for Protective Coatings, and JPCL, the Journal of Protective Coatings and Linings. It's part of our 2017 SSPC JPCL webinar series. You can find out more info about the rest of our schedule by visiting www.paintsquare.com slash webinars. Now before we begin, I want to take a few moments to describe the format of today's webinar. The presentation by Dean Hooks of Thermion will be lecture style and last about 45 minutes. This will be followed by a 10 minute question and answer session. There you'll have the opportunity to submit questions via our questions chat box, which is part of your GoToWebinar control panel that you should see on the right-hand side of your screen. If you're having any technical issues, you may also use that question, the questions chat box to send any questions you might have to us, and we'll do the best we can to address them if anything comes up. For those of you who wish to receive continuing education credits from SSPC, a test is available after today's webinar. The cost of the test is $25, but is free for SSPC members. You can register through the SSPC Marketplace at sspc.org slash market hyphen place. SSPC is also an accredited training provider for the Florida Board of Professional Engineers. If you're interested, you must download and submit the FBPE form along with the completed exam by visiting, once again, www.sspc.org slash market hyphen place. We will repeat this information at the end of the webinar and in a follow-up email. The presentation slides will be available for download immediately after the webinar at paintsquare.com slash webinars. We are also recording today's webinar and we will make it available for replay in our archive again at paintsquare.com slash webinars. It may take up to four to five hours after the conclusion of today's webinar to have the archive completely updated with the recording. Now before uh, we turn the presentation over, I'd like to introduce uh, Dean Hooks. Dean is the Vice President of Marketing and Sales at Thermion. In the 15 years he has worked at Thermion, he has held many roles ranging from construction and repairing Thermion equipment to consulting on projects to working closely on large-scale national global metallizing projects, and he is a member of NACE and is an SSPC thermal spray trainer. Now at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation over to Dean. Hello. Uh, let's see here. Yes, How does my screen look? Nope, we can see your screen. You're good to go. Oh, very good. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, as Josiah said, my name's uh, Dean Hooks from Thermion. Uh, today we're going to be going over, let's see, inspection of thermal spray coatings. Uh, this this presentation is a pretty good overview of, of what's involved. Uh, um, Dean, cool. before, before we jump in, you might want to, you'll want to jump into um, presentation mode now. Okay. Let's see here. Where would that be? Um, go down to the bottom of your screen, and uh, do you see where it says normal view? Uh, yeah. There you go. Um, click there. Take it away. Get it? Yep. Look okay. Good. All right. Very good. So, as I was saying, this uh, this will be an overview of of what's involved in inspecting thermal spray coatings, uh, things to look for, um, procedures, uh, and, and such. So with that, we'll get started here. Um, let, me, let me move this over here to the side. All right. So as I said, this webinar defines thermal spray coatings, um, otherwise known as TSC or referred to as TSC, sometimes called metallizing. And this provides an overview of, of inspection of those coatings. And if I could figure out how to, there we go. So we'll be reviewing procedures for inspection of metallic thermal spray coatings, or TSA, TSC. Um, 
aluminum, zinc, and, and zinc aluminum alloys. In thermal spray, there, there's two sides of, of thermal spray or two sections of coatings. There's uh, sacrificial corrosion protective materials, which is what this uh, webinar is going to speak of. And then there's what's called uh, engineered coatings using other materials outside of uh, the, the zincs and aluminums that are used for abrasion resistance or wear protection and such. Uh, inspection requirements in accordance with the joint standard uh, SSPC CS23 AWS C2.23 and NACE number 12. Those are the, the governing agents of, uh, of inspection here. Uh, thermal spray. What is thermal spray? Thermal spray is taking uh, a feedstock, be it powder or wire, heating it, uh, melting it, basically adding a, uh, a compressed gas. Um, most of the time it's dry compressed air. Uh, that gas atomizes and propels those um, particulate to the, the substrate, which forms a laminar um, coating, basically. The, the, the particles hit the substrate, form what looks like a splat. Uh, that splat leaches and, and grabs on to the, to the base material, whatever the anchor tooth is there, and it uh, builds on top of itself the, the more you spray onto it. Uh, common uh, thermal spray coating materials uh, for corrosion protection would be uh, aluminum, pure aluminum. A couple of different alloys are used there. Uh, pure zinc and then a, an al a pseudo alloy of a, a zinc aluminum mixture. And there's a, there's a couple other materials there that are used as well. But uh, the materials are, like I said, are either in a powder or a, a wire form. So the thermal spray coatings, how, how do they protect steel? They protect steel using the uh, sacrificial anode principle. Uh, if a, a basic uh, understanding of that would be uh, using a, a nobility chart. Um, material Metals at the bottom of the nobility chart will protect metals that are above it uh, that are more noble, similar to that of, uh, of medieval times where you have pawns that would protect the king. That's uh, pretty much the same way a, a sacrificial coating does to steel or whatever its substrate is. It will sacrifice itself to protect it. Special properties. Um, most of the materials have uh, really high a resistance to high temperatures. Uh, aluminum, for instance, uh, typically is used upwards of, of 1,000 degrees, sometimes even 1,100 degree operating temps without a problem. Uh, zinc has a lower melting point, so it's resistant up to about 500 degrees. Um, and then there's zinc aluminum that operates um, in the 500 or less. Uh, good application properties. The materials have a have a really good bond um, bond values when the surface is prepped correctly. Uh, they they you can apply it as as light as a half a mil or half a thousandth uh, and continue to build on that up to whatever the desired thickness is. Uh, the, the thickness of the coating applied is relative to the, the service life and the and the life expectancy of the coating. Meaning, the more you put on, of course, the the longer the coating is going to last. Uh, there, there's a drop-off once you hit a certain degree of, of thickness, of course. Uh, good ed, ed, edge retention uh, and transfer efficiency, the, uh, meaning the amount of material that goes through the arc or goes through the, <clears throat> excuse me, the melting agent and lands on the part. Uh, coatings have good impact and abrasion resistance. You can drop things on them, bang on them, beat on them. They don't, uh, they don't flake off uh, like like other materials do. That got a, a really good ductility to them. Uh, depending on what the environment is, they uh, will determine on what material you use, uh, meaning the, typically the, the pH values uh, will, will tell you uh, if it's better to use zinc because it's a higher acidic uh, environment or aluminum because it's not, and vice versa. Environmental advantages, uh, there's no VOCs uh, because we, we're taking a powder or wire, we're, we're melting it, um, and blowing it or spraying it onto the substrate, there's no um, there's no liquid agents involved. Uh, there, there's um, a dust and fume that's emitted is, is all that uh, is all that you're left with when you're spraying it. So there's no no hazardous air pollutants. Pollutants um, overspray doesn't um, doesn't tend to get beyond about a three or four foot radius of the operator. And if it does, it's a, a mere dust that falls to the ground, so it's easily to easy to clean up. It doesn't you don't have to worry about it adhering to uh, surrounding areas. 
economic advantages. Uh, the, the word green is a pretty uh, been a pretty big buzzword, and wanting to uh, reduce you know, our carbon footprint or um, things of that nature. And th these coatings are long-term protection. You know, typically case studies show 40 plus years of life, uh, low low cycle um, life cycle costs. Meaning the coatings, once they're applied, if they're applied applied correctly, you don't have to go in on on two, three, or four year maintenance cycles and and touch up any of the work. There, once you apply them, uh, they're there till they're till they're gone. Uh, and like I said, case history show a good forty plus years and even longer sometimes. Uh, reduce rework for original coating defects. Um, Small, if there were small touch-up areas that had to be done there, you can localize those to a really small area, and it's real easy to go in and, and um, re-prep said area and spray back over it to get back to where you want it to be. And, of course, uh, all of that reduces the maintenance cost over the coating's life. So going back to the, to the, the buzzword of, of being green, by, by spraying metal, you, you have advantages of... You don't have steel mills having to um, make more product. You don't have the trucking cost of shipping steel to, to build new products. It's, it's a matter of going out to either an existing bridge, uh, removing whatever coating is on there, putting a, a metallized coating on there, and having a, a 40, 40, 80, 100 year uh, life of that, of that product now without having to make new product or new steel. <laughs> Uh, the joint standard I referenced earlier, the SSPC CS23, C2.23, and NACE number 12 was uh, revised back in May 2016. It it governs the application of, of the coatings we're speaking of, uh, or thermal spray coatings, uh, for corrosion protection, the, the zinc aluminum and, and zinc aluminum um, for the corrosion protection of steel. Um, it also covers the required equipment, application procedures, and process quality controls, checkpoints, uh, everything everything you need to know to uh, set up for a successful uh, metallizing job is, is referenced in that standard. Pre-surface prep requirements. Um, you want your steel or your base, base substrate to be at least uh, five degrees above the, the dew point temperature. Uh, you want your the air being used, the dry compressed air or gas to be clean. Um, you can use the, uh, the ASTM uh, 4285 to, to check the cleanliness of that, which is basically taking um, bleeding your uh, an air valve uh, for a few minutes to see if there's any into a container to capture it, to see if there's any signs of moisture or staining. Uh, if nothing's there, you can go further and take a, a white cotton cloth over that bleeding air uh, and, do, and do the same procedure, see if there's anything left in the cloth, and that will tell you if your air is clean or not. Uh, then, of course, you want to make sure your, your grit is clean of clean as well, um, and that's, <clears throat> excuse me, that can be done taking a, a small bottle of, of abrasive, you know, about four or five, six ounces or so, uh, and then fill it with, uh, top it off with, with potable water shake it and see if uh, you see any oil slick uh, rise to the top of the surface. And as long as you don't see any oil slicks, it's, uh, your, your brace is clean. Surface cleanliness. Uh, before before applying any of these coatings we're speaking of, the, the surface needs to be uh, prepped in, in to a degree of uh, either an S, uh, SP5 or an ACE1 or an SP10 uh, NACE number two. A near white metal or white metal. Uh, typically, immersion surface or saltwater applications will call out for a uh, white metal uh, surface prep, and then uh, other areas will call out for a, a near white metal. Um, surface profile, um, usually uh, industry standard calls out for a 2.5 mil anchor tooth uh, using a sharp angular grit. Uh, we, we, we don't use any round shot um, or bead because that uh, peens or dimples the surface, but it doesn't, it doesn't uh, cut and roughen it up for, for the coating to create a, a good enough bond to. Uh, I, I mentioned industry standards, two and a half mil anchor tooth. We, we personally, in our, in, our, in our shop, we like to use a three and a half mil minimum anchor tooth. 
uh, for for us, more is better uh, when it comes to uh, that SHRP uh, profile. Uh, you can measure that using a um, a depth micrometer uh, or replica tape. Uh, the micro micrometer has a little pinpoint on it um, that you basically you set on your prep surface, and that little needle reads into the valleys and tells you what your pro surface profile is. Uh, replica tape is used a lot. It is typically a, a little more subjective. Um, the 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 person performing the test, if he's not um, pushing hard or pushes harder one time or not, uh, that's a direct reflection when he goes to take a reading on that tape. The, the tape, when you're pressing a little uh, ball over it into the, into the profile, um, it reads the peak to valley, and then when you put that in a caliper, it tells you what that reading is. So if, if you're not putting enough pressure or you put too much, you can't really put too much pressure, that, but if you don't put enough pressure, you're not going to get an accurate reading. Uh, but it, it does it does do good work in the field, and it's real portable, easy to easy to use. Uh, these are uh, examples now of, of one of the uh, micrometers I was speaking of, and you can see on the on the right picture the, the little the little tit sticking out of the bottom there. That's that little needle I was talking about. Um, and this this is the replica tape I was talking about. There's there's two different kinds of tape. There's uh, I believe it's coarse and then extra coarse. Um, you have to pay attention to that based on what uh, profile you're you're going to be reading or, or you want to read to uh, because they have limitations on how deep they'll, they'll read. Uh, to the right is a little caliper. Um, you, you set it to zero or you uh, tear tear the thickness of the of the tape on that dial and then you lift it up, set your set your film in and, and read it. Job reference standards are, are typically done at, before the job started. Uh, it's uh, there's there's set um, set requirements on how or how big that that sample piece needs to be, but it's a representative uh, plate of the of the full system that's going to be applied under the under the scope of work. So you have a you'll have an area a blasted area that's representative of what's required on the job. Uh, the, the metallized coating and the thickness that it's supposed to be applied at and what it should look like, sealer if if required, and or top coat. So it's a, it's a good reference, visual reference for, for all involved to be able to refer back to. Inspection of thermal spray coatings thicknesses. Uh, this typically done with a, a DFT gauge, a tri film thickness gauge. Uh, the coatings are non-ferrous, uh, so it's pretty easy to get a reading. Um, usually there's multiple readings taken in, in, in a set area. Um, most specs will call out what your requirements are uh, as far as what you're allotted, whether you're allotted a percentage over or percentage under, or what your average needs to be. Um, and here it's calling out a spot reading between 80% of the specified minimum and 150 of the specified maximum. Um, average area must be within specified thickness. A lot, a lot of specs um, I've seen will actually call out really tight tolerances, like uh, a 10 mil thickness coating is what they want, and you're only allowed two over or two mils under, which is it's not that it can't be done, but um, being being under is is the is an issue, but being four or five mils over isn't as much a concern. It's just a, uh, ultimately it comes down to being just extra product that the contractor is putting on on the part. Uh, but the key there is not to be under. But of course, like I said, your your specified document you're working for will tell you what what's required of you. Uh, this is representative of a piece of blasted metal and an applicator actually applying what looks to be probably zinc aluminum to it. Um, zinc being sprayed has a, has a pretty dim purple haze look to it. Uh, zinc aluminum, because it has 15% aluminum in it, has a, a brighter color to it, similar to what you see on screen. And then aluminum has a, a yet even brighter uh, coloration to it. It's, it's white almost uh, because it has a higher melting point. 
uh, some keys to, to what you see here. It's, there's a lot of flat area, but then if you look on the left side of the screen, there's some tight areas. Uh, normal spray procedure would be to start out in those tight areas and then move on to your larger areas so that you're not uh, overcoating the, those tight areas. And those, those tend to get the most scrutiny, especially when, when inspecting. So it's, uh, it's, it's good for the applicator uh, and, and inspector to, to be aware of getting those areas first and making sure they're right and then moving on to the large flight areas, which are easier to do. So the, typically the, the metallized coatings are, are measured for adhesion, um, mainly to ensure that the coating is bonded well. Uh, there's a, a couple of different uh, adhesion testers that can be used. There's uh, pneumatics. There's uh, I've seen some that are that are automatic that run off CO2 cartridges, um, and then there's there's manuals as well. Uh, but the key there is that you you if your product is prepped right, the coating is applied right, uh, you're going to get a, a good bond. And and which ultimately what you want or what the the owner wants at a project is he wants he doesn't want the coating to fall off so you see in the bottom right of the screen there it shows the different feedstock materials zinc zinc aluminum and, and aluminum and then gives values on what their uh, minimum um, adhesion value should be 500 1000 700 uh, these days there's a lot of a lot of spec writers are are increasing those numbers um, I, I don't necessarily understand that the rationale behind it because a, a zinc coating that's applied at 500 psi is going to perform just as well as one that's applied requiring 750 psi and, and the same holds true to to the other coatings as well just because it's on at 1500 doesn't mean it's going to do a better job than a thousand psi does but thermal spray system requirements so usually um, your spec will call out what what you what's required of you, but typically um, you have a surface, your surface prep is, is, uh, is set at what your uh, profile needs to be, your holding periods from the time that it's blasted, from the time that it's sprayed or, or defined, uh, your surface temp, like I said earlier, uh, of the steel has to be five degrees above the dew point. Uh, the surface needs to be clean, um, not only not only have an anchor tooth, but it, it needs to be clean of any contaminants. Uh, it needs to be um, clean of any dust. Uh, soluble salts have, uh, have and chlorides have really um, come to the forefront on on felled coatings lately, and and they should definitely be tested uh, prior to prior to metallizing. They're uh, they're visible to the naked eye. Uh, just because you blasted it doesn't necessarily mean that you removed them. Uh, you could have very well just embedded them further into uh, into those cricks and crevices that you uh, profile. Uh, surface prep, um, like we said uh, earlier, uh, SP10 or an SP5, uh, near white metal or white metal, uh, usually dependent on the service that it's going to be put into, uh, but sometimes um, sometimes guys want just white metal, period, no matter what. Um, he talks a little there about uh, water-soluble contaminants. Uh, a lot of specs will require a, uh, a degrease prior to, met to uh, blasting, um, and during that degrease, you can also uh, rinse the rinse um, for those for those salts we talked about, and, and then go into your blasting, and then then there's no worry at all that there's any contaminant on the surface. Um, thermal spray coating itself, like I said, you uh, you typically have a, a minimum and maximum of what's required on the spec. Um, different contractors will, or different engineers will, will have different uh, ideas there as far as what they want. Um, most of the time, if the contractor s sees something that draws a red flag, like the tolerances are too thick or it doesn't look doable for the job, it's uh, easy enough to talk to the engineer and, and make some um, adjustments there. Uh, some of the testings for the thermal spray coating itself, like we said, uh, DFT gauges to measure thicknesses. Uh, a, a key there would be for the for the actual applicator to have a gauge on him uh, while he's spraying, especially if, uh, the first couple of days of, of application, so that he can dial himself in and, and be pretty accurate on on what he's putting down, uh, and that's 
that better helps the inspector so that he's um, not spinning his wheels because he's got inconsistent coating thicknesses all over the place. Uh, adhesion values, uh, like I said, those are those are typically preset on the on the spec before the job even starts. So. Uh, non mandatory adhesion test um, so the, the a bin test is a a very very quick um, a very quick test of of a lot of different things so we we talked earlier about a uh, adhesion test and what's required in an adhesion test is you would take a, a dolly a little dolly you mix a two part epoxy um, equal parts mix it up put some on the dolly, actually you'd sand the dolly, uh, wipe it with acetone, put the glue on the dolly, glue the dolly to the coating the coating itself and you have to let it sit for 24 hours so that dolly's glued, the operator is continually doing work, the inspector or whoever it might be isn't going to pull that dolly till the next day. Well there's a lot of work that can get done between that time and the next day so if he, if he has any kind of failure or any kind of issue there then He's, he's already a day ahead of, of, of that problem. So uh, a bin test can be done uh, every day, and it's, it's required on, a, on just about every job I've ever been on. Um, it's, a, it's a four to eight inch long, two inch wide, uh, 50 thousandths inch plate. Uh, it's prepped using the same uh, blast media that's, that's going to be used that day. It's uh, the air that's used, it's the same, the same compressor, uh, that's going to produce the air. The same applicator that's going to be blasting that day or spraying is going to be uh, blasting it and, and applying the metallizing. The same equipment, uh, metallizing equipment, the same, um, the same feedstock. Uh, so the, the applicator would apply the coating, the, the, the thickness of, uh, depending on uh, which mandrels used, uh, but usually it's about 10, 10 thousandths of coating. Uh, using the same technique he's going to use on the job, you know, cross hatching, whatnot, and then he'd take that plate and bend it over a. If it's a fifty thousandths plate with ten thousandths of coating, he would bend that over a twelve millimeter or a half inch diameter diameter mandrel, uh, bend it uh, one hundred eighty degrees, and what you look for is you look for any uh, cracks within that coating uh, on that on that bend bent area. If the coating flakes off, that's an automatic failure. Uh, if it just has minor cracks in it, that's a pass. No cracks, of course, is a pass. Uh, if it has a crack that is approaching about a sixteenth of an inch or so, the, uh, the inspector can take a, a fine-tipped uh, knife, knife edge, stick in the crack and flick it. Uh, the idea is to flick it once. If the coating flakes, it's a failure. Um, but sometimes inspectors like to whittle into that, and that's that's not what that that test is for. It's it's literally meant to flick it; it comes off. It's a failure. Otherwise, it's a pass. So um, if it's a sixteenth or better on a crack, it's it's considered a failure. So this is further describe uh, write, writings of, of what I just described there. Uh, another thing to point out is um, it's real common for, I mean, it's human nature when you pick up that that plate. Say it's it's two inch by six inch for the for the guy who's who just blasted it or is taken over to the applicator to spray it to pick it up in the middle of the plate to kind of balance it. Um, that is, uh, those are typically failure points when you do to go to do the bend because when guys go to bend that over the mandrel, they they usually bend it along the middle uh, and the oils off your fingertips are, are enough, your finger and your thumb are enough on those edges to cause uh, cracking and, and possible delamination on those points. So I actually have seen some specs that um, call out that that doesn't qualify for a failure on those edges just because uh, the human nature wanted to balance it out. But um, in this slide here it shows uh, it as best you can in this black and white photo that is uh, passes and failures. On the far top right, you see there's there's exposed base metal there, which is an automatic failure, of course. Um, and in the middle, you can make out the the, the stress cracks and lines in it. But um, I used to say the middle and the left are, are passes. 
a hammer and chisel cut test. I've um, I've I've never actually seen this done out in the field on jobs. Uh, I know how the test is performed. You uh, you take a chisel uh, to the to the actual coating itself and you uh, pound a hammer on it, and that chisel is uh, meant to um, to either show the coating is adhered well or not. Uh, that abrupt hitting it with a hammer will, if it's a bad coating or a, 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 an issue with the surface profile or whatever, it will actually flake that coating up. Uh, so the next slide here shows you the actual chisel self test itself there. You can see the, the lines behind uh, or above the hammer there where it shows that the chisel cut into the coating, uh, but it doesn't flake off. This is a better representative here. So you see that the chisel uh, knocked the, the peaks down on the metalized coating, but it didn't cut through the coating, it didn't lift the coating off, uh, nothing like that. Whereas here, when the coating wasn't applied, or the surface prep or coating not applied right, um, the chisel physically removed the coating, chipped it off in those areas. So with that, um, I'll kind of open the floor for uh, for questions. Um. Okay, very good. So at this point, uh, this will begin the this portion of the Q and A session for today's webinar. Uh, if you'd like to ask any questions, please enter them into the Go To Webinar control panel that you can see on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, so let's just, uh, we'll get going in just a second here. Uh, let's see what we have as far as questions that have already come in. Is there a minimum application temperature? Minimum application temperature of the of the substrate. Uh, they they do not go into more detail outside of that, but why don't we just say yeah as the substrate? Um, you you know I I've seen guys apply metalizing to uh, substrates that were a couple hundred degrees, uh, and I've seen. Some of our customers up in, in Alaska who work uh, out on the uh, Timbuktu where they, they can only get to and from the work area using the ice roads, um, meaning to say when, when, the, uh, when the temperature is warmer than negative 20 degrees F, they have to stop work because they can't travel on the ice road. So those substrates are pretty cold. Um, I don't know exactly what the temperatures are, but I know that they put uh, – they put heaters blown on the motors of the of the arc spray systems in order to keep the oil from gelling up inside of them. So it's it's pretty daggum cold. So um, I don't know if that directly answers your question. Uh, I don't know what the what the maximum per se would be, but if it's hot enough, or if it's if the applicator can stand being in there spraying on it, uh, then then it's it's okay. Okay. Uh, here's a question that came in a little bit earlier today. Uh, the question is. Um, why is the bond strength measured with a self-aligned instrument and not a fixed alignment? I have no idea. All right, very good. If, it, if anybody wants to, uh, I was not anybody, if that uh, particular uh, attendee wants to elaborate a little more on their particular question, uh, please feel free to, uh, you know, reword the question and send it back in, and we'll see if we can cover it if we have what? time to. What was the question again, Josiah? Uh, why is the bond strength measured with a self-aligned instrument and not a fixed alignment? Hmm. I, you know, I, I, I'd be guessing, but I, I'm thinking he, they're talking about the the fixture that goes over the dolly, uh, and uh, self-aligning would would um, align the the head fixture that goes over the dolly so that it's it's straight rather than pulling on that dolly at an angle which is um, which wouldn't give you an accurate reading so that that would be my interpretation of that question but like I said I'm guessing that. 
Okay, um, the, uh, here's an attendee here is uh, asking if you could elaborate uh, more on uh, flame cut edges and the difficulties that arise with them. Oh, sure. Um, so when, when prep and steel, there's a, there's a few areas that, that you want to pay close attention to, uh, sharp ed edges uh, and flame cut edges. Uh, flame cut, because when during the flame cutting process, you harden the steel in that localized area. So before you can blast you, any profile on that hardened edge, you have to take a grinder and physically grind that hardened surface area off. And I, I've been asked before, how, how much do you grind off? There's not really a set value there. But what you'll notice when you're grinding is, uh, when you start grinding is you notice you're not removing any steel. But as soon as you get beyond that hardened surface, you'll start seeing this, the steel uh, coming off of it pretty quick. will let you know you've, you've hit normal steel instead of that hardened surface. Uh, so you most definitely want to remove that hardened edge before you blast on it. Uh, and then going to the uh, sharp, sharp edges. Um, you want to radius those uh, about an eighth of an inch or better um, so that you don't have a, a, a sharp edge that, that you can't get a profile on. What is an appropriate touch-up procedure for <clears throat> small failure areas? Um, it would de depend on what that, what that failure was. Um, so I'll, I'll go over a, a few here. Um, some some uh, inspectors require that you pull to destruction on a coating, meaning when you're doing your, your adhesion test, if it calls out for 500, you, you keep pulling until the, the actual coating fails and, and the dolly comes off, so it might pull to 1,000. Uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me. I, I've always abdicated that you, you pull till you reach a requirement and then you and then you release pressure on it, heat the dolly up and, and uh, with, a, with a torch and then take the dolly off, and then you don't have a repair area. Uh, but if you were to repair that area, you could um, take and, and mask off about an inch or so around the felled area, uh, and you'd want to go through and you'd want to blast that area up. Uh, if in that blasting process you see the coating uh, surrounding that felled area readily coming up, then you'd want to uh, make your touch-up area masking larger because if it's metallizing doesn't come up easy. So if you're blasting on it and it just starts coming up, you want to keep uh, blasting it back until it doesn't come off readily. Uh, once that's done uh, and you have your profile there, um, you would you could take and, like I said, you have that area masked off and you would take and, and spray it up and build it up and then tie it in, like I said, about an inch to the surrounding metallizing that's already there. How well does TSC hold up in an underground installation? An underground ins installation? Yes, installation, yes. yes. Uh, well, it's, it's performed very well in um, pilings in, in salt water where they're driven into the ground. Um, I know I, I've heard of a lot of pipe that's been coated and, and laid. It would, it would uh, depending on what the uh, basic soil composition be, you know, uh, would, would determine on what coating to use. But I've, I've heard of it holding up very well myself. Is it possible to control the porosity of the applied TSC during application? Uh, yes, but um, meaning there, because the coating goes down in particles, there is a degree of porosity which isn't, isn't necessarily a, a bad thing. Um, usually, you can expect to see anywhere from about a three to three to five, three to seven uh, percent porosity level. Uh, I've seen coatings uh, in the, the ten to fifteen percent range. Um, when when it, when you ask, can you control it? You can. Um, make sure the equipment is running at its optimal, which is going to ensure the, the lowest porosity level you can get. Um, unfortunately, and, and when jobs are going, uh, time is, uh, there's never any time for maintenance or never any time to, uh, to look after things the way they're supposed to. So, so things are, are let go, uh, and that lends itself to 
um, not running optimally, which tends to lead to higher porosity coatings. Uh, higher porosity coatings um, can be problematic, uh, meaning if you are usually when you're applying uh, metallized coating, you look for a uh, an eight to ten mil thickness will uh, ninety nine percent ninety nine point nine percent ensure that you don't have a pinhole through the substrate uh, using normal porosity levels. Uh, if you're operating on that that eight mil threshold and your equipment isn't running optimally and you have a higher percentage of porosity in your coating, you have a higher degree of a uh, bigger potential of there being a pinhole through the substrate. So that, that can be problematic. Are samples tested in salt fog cabinets? Yes. They've uh, they've been doing they've been doing and redoing that test for probably eighty years. There's if you uh, if you do a Google search, I'm sure you can find hundreds of, of salt fog tests performed on metallizing. Hours all over the place. Uh, can you go to some detail discussing the hold period between uh, blasting and application? How do you deal with extended hold periods in excess of uh, more than a typical few hours? So used to the rule of thumb was, um, well, the rule of thumb is you don't blast more than you're going to spray for a day. Um, the, the caveat there is if you're working an eight-hour shift, you're going to blast for, spray for four. Uh, if it's a large component, the uh, contractor might want to go in and profile the entire component and then only sweep blast what he's going to spray day in and day out because he's already got his profile on, the, on it to begin with. Um, going back to the, the, hold, uh, the hold question itself, uh, used to it was uh, commonplace for eight to ten hours to be okay on the hold. Uh, that window has, has been uh, steadily shrinking. Uh, and it, it's all relative to the to the environment that you're in. Uh, if, if a contractor's uh, operating out outside or in a high humidity climate, such as uh, say Corpus Christi, te Texas, in the Gulf area, he's only going to see about an hour and a half, two hours from a fresh blast to flash rust. Uh, so his window is a lot shorter. Uh, whereas if you're in a drier climate, um, you know the, the, you can hold that a lot longer. Uh, things you can do to extend that time would be uh, have a controlled environment, meaning have your product inside uh, so that you, uh, you're uh, it's not seeing hot, cold, it's not seeing uh, moisture, rain, uh, and such. So there you go. All right, I'm just going through. There, These questions are coming in at a pretty healthy click here, so I'm just a uh, healthy clip, I should say, here. So I just want to you know, get another one good here. Um, what is the best method to protect areas um, that are not accessible to TSC? Uh, I don't I don't understand the question. The best area to protect areas that aren't going to get metallized? Um, I, that, that question was verbatim. Again, I, I'd advise the, uh, the person who asked the question if they can to uh, revise the question and maybe reword it a little better. Uh, so let's see here. Uh, let's move on to another question here. Um, All right, here, let's let's give this one a go. What happens when the film thickness begins to exceed 150% of the thickness? Does spalling begin to occur? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I've seen, um, <laughs> I've seen coatings uh, be applied at, at upwards of a, uh, of an inch and and not have spalling happen, which is um, it was it wasn't done on the job. It was just done to to play around with the coating itself. But uh, um, 150 percent of the coating, say it was applied at 10 mils, 
would be what um, 25 mils if my math's right there um, and at 25 mils no you wouldn't see spawn um, all right here is um, here's two questions that came in right back to back here and I'm, I'm assuming that they are um, I guess you could say that they're they work together here so um, the first first question is are primers inter and intermediate um, all right, let me say that again. Are primers and intermediate as well as top coats applied using TSC? Um, and what are uh, the wait times between coats? Uh, so I, I think they're asking, can you apply sealers or top coats or primers to a metallized coating? And the, the answer is yes. Uh, the metallizing itself is a, it's, it's an immediate cure. So um, the coating is used in a couple of different ways, but ultimately the applicator sprays a said component, he, he has his millage on it, it can go right into service right then and there, uh, or it can get sealed or top coated. Um, typically, uh, inspectors want to see a sealer coat applied to it. If it's going to be applied to it, they want to see it applied within, uh, within 24 hours, and most of the time it's even tighter than that, um, 8 to 12 hours or so. Um, and then it's just a matter of waiting for that sealer coat or primer coat to to dry before you add a top coat onto it. Uh, I will say that the key to a, a sealer or primer, whatever you want to call it, the, the key to the first liquid coating, if applied to a metallized coating, would be that it's thinned down so that it absorbs into the coating. It, it sucks into all those little nooks and crannies and it's applied really thin so that it does just that. If it's applied too thick, where it, it won't soak into the coating, you uh, you can create a little uh, micro cell in there that will accelerate at a, at a really fast rate and cause your problems down the road. Are the application and testing procedures similar for iron castings or ductile iron pipe? Uh, does the surface need to be blasted? Now we have we have a few uh, ductile iron guys that um, I want to say they they operate under a uh, European standard where it requires uh, a certain amount of grams per square meter, uh, but ultimately they they do not actually blast the component. Uh, they, they pull their uh, ductile iron out of the, out of the uh, cast and it has, uh, it has a profile on it from that, from that casting itself. And in that case, they just go and apply zinc right to it. Is it necessary to apply a mist coat on thermal spray before full coat? Uh, I'm, I'm assuming they're talking a, a mist coat of metallizing and, and the answer would be no. Um, you can uh, standard rate of movement when uh, metallizing would be uh, about 12 inches a second. So if you count 1,001, you should move approximately a foot. Uh, some applicators move faster, some move slower. Uh, the key is that he's consistent in that movement, whether he's fast or slow, so that he knows um, you know, person A moves faster. He's only getting one mil per pass. He's he needs eight mils to, to reach his goal, so that means he's got to make a minimum of eight passes to meet there. You know, person B might might move slower. He might get three mils on a pass, so he knows uh, three mil three passes is going to give him nine mils, which which meets his his goal there. So, um, no, uh, you don't have to put a mist coat on, um, but it's best if you just move consistently, so that you know overall on average that you're going to have a consistent coating thickness. All right. I, I think we're going to cover one more question before we uh, wrap up today here. Um, possibly maybe one or two more following this one. Um, in the case of dry of the in the in the case of an instance where the dry film thickness is lower than the specification, uh, what is your re recommendation? And is it possible to reapply on TSM, or is it necessary to reblast and reapply? Uh, the the fix would be to just apply more coating to it, uh, which I guess kind of answers the second part of that question. Uh, usually, uh, as long as it's within 24 hours, uh, you can go back in and apply um, 
however many more passes you need to get the millage up to where you want it to be. Uh, in some cases, um, some specs will call out for a, a part that's been metallized to be uh, put out in the yard and then hosed down with water. Uh, and the goal there to, is to see if there's uh, any lighter areas or pinholes through to the substrate, which uh, will show itself within 24 hours as a, as a rust bloom, a big uh, rosy colored uh, bloom. It, you know, it might have derived from a pinhole the size of a pencil lab, but it will show itself in, a, in about a, a foot of, of bloom on the part, which the fix there would be just to take that part and, and sweep the uh, rust bloom off and just reapply a few uh, reapply metallizing to it to build the thickness up to where it needs to be. So so the, I guess the answer is uh, just apply more coating till you reach your desired thickness. Okay. Um, here is a, here's a pretty broad question slash request, so I think we could probably finish with this one. Uh, this, this individual is asking if you could go into a little bit of detail about um, thermal spray coatings on naval ships and flight decks. Uh, that's a, a great question. We've uh, we've done a lot of um, we've actually applied a, a lot of square footage on, on the decks of uh, of navy boats as of late uh, using a uh, using thermal spray, which is uh, considered a, a non traditional um, non skid form. Uh, it's a it's it's a dual duty coating, so it's uh, an aluminum based material with uh, ceramic oxides inside of it, so you get the the corrosion protection from the aluminum, uh, which is also the binding matrix to hold those um, hard ceramic oxides in place, which which offers the uh, the non-skid coating there. So it uh, all the testing they've done has uh, proved it to be uh, superior to anything they've used before, and they the Navy itself has projected a 10 plus year service life on on that, whereas their their current uh, epoxies and such that they've been using uh, only offered about a six-month lifespan, and uh, on the long time would be a would be a year. So there's a sig significant gain form there. Okay, um, I lied. I said that that was going to be the final question, but it looks like we did have a follow-up to the one question that. Um, I asked for the person to expand a little more. Uh, sure. So let's see if we can tackle this one here. Um, uh, what is the, or, and this is the reworded version, what is the best way to protect areas that cannot be reached with TSC equipment such as snipes, uh, tight corners, so on? Uh, most, yeah, and those those come up a lot. The So what, I, what I've, often told guys is if you can get a blast nozzle in and ricochet the, the blast media into those tight areas and, and get a any kind of profile there, um, you're going to do similar when you go to spray metallizing in those areas that, that because you're uh, you're blowing the metallizing in there with such force it's going to ricochet and, and just it'll, it'll lay in there. Uh, a lot of inspectors or owners don't want to they, they want a more concrete answer, so uh, rather than just saying it's going to lay in there, which it'll still perform its function, but um, most of those guys will end up just taking a, a, a brush or paint or trying to just paint a coating in there. I don't, I don't know of any liquid coating or, or other coating outside of metallizing to use in those areas that, that's going to perform best, so I don't, I don't really have an answer there. But if it were my component, I would... Uh, I would do what I what I first recommended, which is blow media in there. If you can get it clean and get any kind of profile, it'll all do the same thing with metallizing and call it good. All right, very good. So, and with that, I want to thank everyone who sent in questions today. Uh, we didn't get a chance to cover every question, but again, feel free to send them over as uh, we are compiling them. Uh, so with that, there are a couple topics that I do want to cover with everyone before we wrap up today. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning of this particular webinar, you may choose to register and complete a short test through the SSPC Marketplace to earn a continuing education unit. The test costs $25 and can be found at sspc.org slash market hyphen place. Uh, the test is $25 uh, but is free for SSPC members. Upon completion, you may earn one continuing education credit from SSPC or from the Florida Board of Professional Engineers. 
Today's presentation is being recorded and will soon be available for replay through the Paint Square webinar archives. Please give us up to four hours to get the recording posted and ready for replay. You'll be able to find the archive at paintsquare.com slash webinars. A copy of the slides used for today's presentation will also be made available in the webinar archives. Excuse me. I'm tripping over my words there. A copy of the slides used for today's presentation will also be made available in the webinar archives section at paintsquare.com. Hey Josiah. Yes. If uh, if anyone has you know additional questions or wants to talk to me, they they can email me at uh, dhooks at thermineinc.com. I'd be happy to answer whatever questions they might have. Okay. And again, just to repeat, that's. Uh, dhooks at thermianinc.com. Um, if you're not already receiving the Paint Square News daily e-newsletter, we encourage you to sign up at paintsquare.com slash PSN. You can see top headlines of protective and marine coatings as well as industry news, selected features from JPCL, and other online features like problem-solving forums, coding quizzes, and polls. So finally, on behalf of SSPC and JPCL, I'd like to thank Dean Hooks for a very entertaining and educational presentation. And of course, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us today. We look forward to presenting more webinars that will be educational and useful in your work. This concludes today's webinar. Have a great day, everyone.